Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I'm slowly in the process of getting the SCT back outside to do some imaging before all the galaxies run away. And I figured this is probably as good a time as any to do some of those tasks that we seldom have to do and probably shouldn't do very often, which is cleaning the corrector plate and collimating the SCT. So I thought I'd take a few minutes here in this video and show you what, uh, what I do for cleaning and collimation. First I'm going to go through a little video of me cleaning the corrector plate indoors. Then we'll do a walk around tour of the telescope setup outside. I've made some changes to the setup. And then finally we'll take a look at a video where I'm collimating the SCT by making the adjustments to the uh, secondary mirror. So yeah, let's get started. What we have to have in order to start this little process is a brush and we'll use this very soft brush here to brush off any loose dirt dust that happens to be on the uh, corrector plate. We have a air bulb here we can uh, try to help dislodge whatever is left over. We have our cleaning fluid. This is Zeiss lens cleaner and we have some PEC pads here that we'll uh, use to clean up the corrector plate once we've got the loose dirt off. We're going to take this brush and just kind of go around just trying to get rid of anything that's just loose and hanging there that we don't want to deal with. And anything we can blow out of there, the better off we'll be. Try to get up around the corners here. Again, just trying to loosen up anything that happens to be a little loose and things that are very loose we can get rid of just by blowing air over the surface. Next thing we'll do, we're going to work in little sections here with these PEC pads and this cleaning fluid. We'll start off by squirting some fluid and then we'll kind of squeegee it around and pick up loose dirt, throw away the PEC pad, get a new PEC pad, bring it on around and just work in a very systematic way. We're not going to be rubbing back and forth. We're not going to be making circular motions. It's just one direction. Bring the pad in and kind of curve up as we go to pick up any loose dirt that happens to be on the uh, corrector plate. And these large corrector plates on these SETs, they collect a lot of dirt. So I'm going to fold this over. I'm going to start up here at the top. Work in a little section, let it sit there for a bit. I've got this PEC pad folded over. Rotate. And I'm throwing that one away. Fold it over. Throw that one away. Get another one, fold it over. And then finally in this last section, I'm going to make one last pass with a fresh pad. That's going to be our corrector plate for this galaxy season. Okay guys, well I finally got the SCT out in the yard. You can see the triangular patch there where, where it's been uh, covered for six months. I'm not allowing the grass to grow. A couple of changes to the setup here. Mounted the ultimate power box on its perforated plate here to two screws that are the mirror image of these guys over here with the finder scope. In fact, I moved the finder scope over to that side so that I could have the power box on this side. So the data cable will come out here, the power cable will come out here, the mount power cable is down here. But it's a very secure connection here. Cable management works out very nicely. Here's my troublesome focuser still on. Uh, another thing I've done is put on that uh, offset mass 
off to the side here and I've done the balancing act and I have a longer all thread than needed so I need to cut off the excess but this is a manageable length and it balances the scope when it's uh, hanging off to the side as it is right now for example it would be uh, balanced in this configuration so that's good another thing that I'm doing started doing more or less recently is putting the outdoor electronics the handset and the serial to USB cable adapter here. Put them in uh, these bags, sealed bags, with just a couple of holes cut uh, to allow the cables to get out. And this avoids having uh, excess dew collect on those electrical, uh, in the electrical connections. Okay, so just to wrap up some of the things that we saw in the video, I've made a few changes since. On this side, I did mention that I'm putting the electrical components in plastic baggies to kind of prevent dew from forming on otherwise, hopefully, sensitive pieces of equipment and not doing any damage. So I think that's working. It looks stupid, but I think it, uh, it works okay. And I finally ended up with a configuration with three of these 200 gram weights. That's about 1.3 pounds. And the center of the weights are about 8 inches from the center line of the scope. So it's a fairly compact distance. Uh, it does provide pretty good deck balance for all different orientations that, that I might put the scope in, which is, is helpful and should improve guiding it. And then, as I noted, uh, the Ultimate Power Box is now mounted securely to a couple of screws like these used here to mount the finder scope, but it's it's attached to a perforated plate and screwed on to the OTA from here, and it's right along an axis, the deck axis, so it's not exerting any tendency to want to uh, rotate about the deck axis. Uh, but it is a bit high up. Nevertheless, it's a it's a good location and makes cable management uh, fairly compact, which is a good thing. The dew shield and looking at the effects of dew and trying to prevent dew was a big subject of last year's galaxy season. I finally ended up with a three inch long dew shield, a homemade dew shield that uh, was three inches projected length here. And what I've done since then is with this original AstraZap dew shield that's about three to four times longer than what you see here, I've cut it down to the same length as that homemade dew shield that I was using. I have the dew strap wrapped around the perimeter circumference of the scope, hanging off about halfway, and then I've got the AstraZap dew shield uh, wrapped around it. The nice thing about the AstraZap dew shield, actually there are a number of things that are nice about it. One, it's a lightweight foam. Uh, so it provides some insulation as well. Second, it's got a nice matte black uh, in, inside interior here, which helps to cut down on reflections. It's also got a compressible foam around this base here so that you can squeeze in on whatever, on the, on the uh, OTA, or in my case, the, the uh, dew strap. And then a Velcro strap, a good bit of Velcro on the side here to bring the pieces together. And so you can clamp down and get a very secure connection of this uh, dew shield to uh, whatever it is you're connecting to. So you don't have to worry about it blowing off or falling off. And uh, so that's what I've got here. I think this, is, this should work. I've been out and have tested it at least uh, one night worth of imaging and it, it worked just fine. Let's go uh, talk a little bit about some of the collimation. What we're going to be doing, I'm going to be showing you a video I recorded of the screen as I was making some collimation adjustments. And when we say we're collimating, what we're doing is taking this secondary mirror and adjusting its angle so that light coming in from this side of the scope, bouncing off the primary mirror and hitting the secondary mirror here, ends up at a spot. And likewise, light coming in over here and hitting the primary mirror and bouncing up reflects off and hits the same spot. So we're trying to get change the orientation of the secondary mirror so that we can get all that light ending up at the same spot. And you do that by making adjustments. In this case with the Celestron scope, there are three Phillips head screws here, here, and here. And you reveal these by rotating this three pedal uh, cover around so that you expose the screws. I found that making the adjustments with a screwdriver was uh, fairly easy to do and was safe. Uh, one of the things you worry about when holding a piece of metal above your corrector plate is uh, something slipping and scratching the corrector plate. I didn't find that to be that risky. Uh, you're, you are working inside a recessed area here, so if the screwdriver were to slip off the screw, it's just going to be confined within this uh, recessed area. So it's really not that uh, big of a deal. And let's go over to Astrophotography Tool and look at some of the features Astrophotography Tool has 
for uh, helping you out with the collimation. What we're looking at here is a still image. This is Denobla. I've got it just in the in the center here, and we'll use this as a backdrop for some of the uh, things that we'll be doing. Now, there are a number of tools in Astrophotography Tool that, that are very practical. It's one of the things I do like about Astrophotography Tool. There's a number of these secondary little tools that are just you just find you need to do your job as an astrophotographer. One of them is uh, being able to put down a center cursor, a center mark here, and this is one of the things you're going to want to do. In this case, these stars are fairly well focused but when you're doing a collimation you probably want to be in live view mode you want to set the exposure you want to find a bright star set the exposure so that as you when you defocus the star to reveal a set of concentric rings that you can see those rings in a live view mode and you'll see the settings that I used in in my collimation in just a minute but in live view mode uh, with this thing defocused, you'll see a, a center point in the star, and you'll see concentric rings. And then what you want to do is a, using the scope control, uh, mount control uh, handset, you want to move the scope so that the center of that defocused star is at the center of the uh, view here. Now, once you're in, once you get it centered, what you want to do is to see a, a magnified view, and you'd like to do the uh, double click and get into one-to-one -one mode, but you can't do that uh, with the uh, crosshairs activated. So you need to turn off the crosshairs, and then you can go into one-to-one -one mode like that. Now, again, for a collimation, this won't be this bright star here. It'll be a, a much less bright uh, set of, of off-center circles, basically. And then what you can do is to uh, magnify that view uh, if you have to, uh, or you can go directly to the collimation aid. Now, in the video I'm going to show you, I didn't use the collimation aid. I had a lot of other stuff going on with poor seeing, so it wasn't that easy, but I think it's good to show what it can do. So this collimation aid is very useful. This is the kind of thing you're going to want to be looking at, and you're going to want to put that center of the dot you see in your deep focus star, obviously right here in the center, and all the rings should be, the each ring here can be uh, lined up, and you can play with the number of rings you have or you can play with the spacing of the rings and so there's different things you can do to try to make this image match the image that you're seeing on the screen as an aid for uh, when you're collimating to make sure the center spot and the uh, circles are all uh, concentric. Now one of the things that you can do is make adjustments to the size of this for example I can go down to 100 pixels. The thing is I've noticed that when you do this it doesn't change the size so then you need to kind of come in and press the up or down button here to adjust it manually to make that when you type in a number to make that number uh, kick in and take effect. All right so that's the collimation aid. It's very nice because you can like I say you can move it around to where the star actually is. Another thing that's a nice tool and the one that I ended up using during my collimation effort was the magnifier tool. The nice thing about this tool is that it works in conjunction with the collimation aid. This, we're going to magnify everything that's on the screen. And so if we move this in place, we can see the circles and we can see the star. And so that's a very useful uh, effect and a very useful tool for being able to uh, zoom in and see a, an otherwise smaller star. In my case, the collimation star that I was using ended up making a much smaller uh, image on the screen than this uh, very overexposed picture of Denobla. But I think these tools, particularly on a night we're seeing is good, could be very useful in working uh, together to make a change. When you make adjustments of the secondary mirror with a screwdriver, you're going to find that star is going to take off on you. So uh, the scope will bring it back, or the mount will bring it more or less back to where it was, but not precisely. And in that case, what you'll have to do is just move the magnifier out, move the crosshairs of the collimation aid if you're using it over to where the star is assuming you're not too far off from the center of the field of view it could be that you have to go back and make adjustments of the mount and then you can move the magnifier back over the top of it but that works fairly well if you do have to uh, go back and actually want to move the mount to the center of the uh, to, to center of the star once again you may have to get out of these tools and get out of one-to-one -one mode, bring up the crosshairs again, and repeat the process. Okay, so let's go over to a video that I shot while I was making these adjustments. I've got a defocus star. I'm going to bring up the magnifier and set it over the star so I can see it better.
Now looking at this image, and it's only magnified by a factor of three, and you'll notice I'm in one-to-one -one mode up at the upper left of the screen, and I'm also in live view. You can see the settings. It's a 20 uh, millisecond exposure at gain 139. The center dot there is a bit off-center, but it's also not that easy to tell given the nature of the scene conditions, so that star image is jumping around all over the place. Now, what I'm going to do is insert my hand in the field of view and try to create a shadow so I can tell uh, which screw or set of pair of screws is closest to the edge where the dot is closest to the edge. And so that's how you're going to locate and identify which screw it is that you want to turn. So I'm inserting my hand here to identify and try to figure out the location of the screw closest to where it's uh, at the edge and now I'm shining a flashlight down the axis to locate the uh, position of the Phillips screw and now I'm making an adjustment as you can see the star is moving around quite a bit as I make this adjustment. Now if the adjustment's not too bad and the position comes back to nearly where it was then I can just kind of move the magnifier window back over to where it was. And frankly the off-center nature of the center dot does not look too bad and sometimes it might be better particularly on a night like this where it's seeing is not that great to just leave well enough alone. I continue to play with a little bit just to gain some uh, familiarity with how this thing responds when I make small adjustments of the uh, these three screws. It looks a tad off-center here so it looks like I could make some more adjustments I think to try to pull that center dot into the center of the, the circles. One of the things that you can do is leave the magnifier in place if it's centered over the center of your screen. And as I'm doing here, I'm adjusting the mount's position or pointing of the telescope to bring the defocused star back into the view of the magnifier, which implies that it's still in the center of the field of view. And it looks like it's pretty far out of collimation at this point. The center dot does appear to be very close to the outer edge. So I'm actually worse off currently than I was when I started making the adjustments. So there's another adjustment trying to get it uh, more centered. And I'm going to go back out to the fit view, put the crosshairs back on and recenter the star. I've made a lot of adjustments so it's always good to, every once in a while to go back to the wide field view and, and get the star back where it should be which is in the center of the view and that's what I'm doing here. So you've got to turn off the center crosshairs to in order to double click on the screen and bring the uh, one to one view mode back up and now putting the magnifier back over what is now the center of the field of view and after a few more adjustments I think it's fairly well back to where uh, we want it to be and we're pretty darn near collimated or at least as as well as we can tell under these uh, seeing conditions. I'm going to make one final check here of the uh, collimation by moving the star back close to the magnifier and then making a little adjustment of the magnifier position onto the star. And I think the center dot is more or less in the center of the image and the, and the circles are more or less concentric. Again, hard to tell with this kind of uh, bad seeing conditions. Let's just summarize what we've been through in this video here. The first thing I did was clean the corrector plate. Again, not something you want to do very often, only when necessary. That's why I'm not going to claim to be an expert because I don't get that much practice and neither should you, frankly, get too much practice doing this. I find that I have to clean the corrector plate of my SCT a lot more frequently than I clean the lenses of my refractors. In fact, some of the refractors I haven't cleaned at all. They just don't get dirty, whereas the corrector plate is very large and you have a large area exposed to dust and when dew occurs you get some residual dew spots. Cleaning the corrector plate is a lot more common task than cleaning the lenses for my other smaller diameter refractors. Uh, the first thing you want to do is use a fluid that won't harm the coatings on any optical glass and in my case I'm using some fluid that is sold by uh, Zeiss and hopefully uh, they make some good uh, cleaning fluid that are uh, compatible with with uh, coated lenses. Also you want to use these soft uh, claws. I'm using these PEC pads to uh, clean the glass. They, they are specifically manufactured so that you don't get small fibers separating and, and, and having those now uh, on your glass. So they they are very clean in that respect. They're not leaving behind uh, fibers. 
uh, when you're using these claws, you want to always work in a single direction. This is not a rubbing action. Uh, this is a work in a single direction, and as you press the cloth against the wetted surface, you want to rotate the cloth as you move so that you're lifting up the dirt and also simultaneously exposing a clean part of the cloth to the glass. Throw away that pad and move on to the next one as you work your way around the area of the uh, corrector plate. And also, you might find that cleaning the uh, corrector plate or cleaning the lenses outside is maybe a, a best thing, the better thing if you can do it. The uh, circulation of the air just moving around helps to evaporate uh, excess fluid. It also uh, makes it very easy to spot leftover streaks that you might want to take care of. And in fact, after I cleaned the corrector plate indoors and put the telescope outside, I found a few more streaks that I, I wanted to get rid of. So I, I almost repeated the very process outside. So I would suggest if you can, uh, do this outside so that you can uh, see the real effect of what you're of what you're doing. SCT collimation is another thing that is it should be rare as well. We should not be doing this very often. Your your scope should not require this to be done very often. Defocus a bright star and then center that defocused image in the center of your field of view. And a defocused image in this sense means that you you've gone far enough out of focus so that you can see what ultimately should be a set of concentric circles. APT is actually very useful and they have a, a lot of useful tools for uh, aiding you in the collimation process. Certainly there's the crosshairs you could use for centering the star. Once you get the star centered you'll need to turn off the crosshairs so that you can go into one-to-one -one mode and all of this while being in in live view mode so you want to pick an exposure time uh, that and and gain that allows you to see in real time what the effects are and then uh, the magnifier tool I found is very useful and that's what I used in the video but and when the sky is is has a bit more a bit better seeing conditions the collimation aid should also be very useful and the one thing I like about APT is once you get it into one-to-one -one mode you can bring up the collimation aid adjust the size of the circles the number of, of interior circles and place that or easily place that over the star just by dragging the image of this concentric circle objective target uh, over the star and then you can bring up the magnifier tool and overlay that on top of the image produced by the collimation aid. When you're making these adjustments what you're trying to do is achieve a set of concentric circles about a center spot. Now you'll see a center dot when you defocus the star. You'll find that that center dot is closer to one edge and farther away from the opposite edge so along a diameter. So you want to find that diameter where that that offset occurs and you do that in live view again by moving your hand in front of the field of view so that you can see where the shadow of your hand is in the live view image and then when you get your your hand over that area where that uh, off-center axis is that helps you to identify which screw to turn or which pair of screws to turn to change the collimation. I found that working with the screwdriver was fine. I was a little concerned that if I slept with the screwdriver it might go off and hit the uh, corrector plate. That's really not a concern at all because you're working inside this uh, recessed area here. Now one thing you want to be careful of though is this one quarter of a turn of the screw is a big adjustment. So I would suggest finding that off-center axis, picking a screw to work with, and then turning that screw about a quarter of a turn. That way you will see a big effect and you can convince yourself that yes it made it worse, it made it better. And then any subsequent adjustments can be either reverse the action you did if you made things worse or make smaller and smaller uh, adjustments to the screw uh, to refine the location of that center dot into the center of all, all the circles. When you make a, an adjustment with the screw, just repeat it to yourself clockwise or counterclockwise so that it's always in, in the front of your mind as to which way you actually turn the screw. It is better to collimate during good seeing conditions if you have them. Uh, in my case, and what you saw the video is what happens when you're trying to collimate in less than good seeing conditions. I think it's still doable but you could see from the video that it's uh, there's a good bit of guesswork going on. I think that's about it for now guys so clear skies, clean skies, collimated skies and I'll talk to you guys later.